Father, that's our prayer this morning. Living in a world that has so many things happening every day, every minute, right, left, and center, we want to call unto you. When our hearts are overwhelmed, we want to cry out to the rock that is higher than us. That's the rock, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we cry out to you, our rescuer. We cry out to you, our redeemer. We cry out to you, our savior. Attend unto our prayers this morning. We thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can give the Lord a clap as you take your seats. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Excited of what God is doing in this time and in this season. And like Pastor Millicent was uh, leading us and uh, the songs came speaking to us. We are not here because we are better than the people out there. We are not preserved because there is something that we knew how to do. We are not better Christians than the people who are out there going through situations. We are here because of the grace of God. We are here because God has ordained that we would be here this morning. I want to appreciate our, our Pastor Bishop Jimmy Kimani and Pastor Alice for allowing us to keep doing this and for leading us during times like this when, uh, when you are overwhelmed and you're thinking, I need to run, I need to go. I, I don't want to be there because of the, the way things are happening. But they have kept on giving us guidance. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you and watch over you. I want to share briefly, uh, we well, are briefly, like in the next 34 minutes, um, about a, just a thought uh, concerning what we, we have sung. And I feel the Lord speaking to me so strongly about the, the fact that he's able to rescue us. And like we have said, he's not going to rescue us because we were better than others. Not because we were better Christians. He's going to rescue us because he is the rescuer. He's going to rescue us because he has a purpose for each one of us. And he does in his sovereignty, he does what he does when he wants with whoever. The only thing that we can do is walk, walk, and align ourselves to what he's doing. The, the, the people of God, the, I dare to say the servants of God who have passed on during this pandemic, it's not because they were bad. It's just because God allowed it to happen and their time was up. I'm, I'm one person who is thinking that this time people shouldn't be dying of other things because we have a pandemic and it's taking so many people. So that if I were God, thank God I'm not, I would stop all, all those other ways of people dying because there is a pandemic that is just overwhelming us. So when you hear somebody has died of an accident, when you hear somebody has, has died of whatever, you are like, even you? You are coming to take people, you, you accidents, you whatever. When you hear Nikolala tu alafu hawamuki, hata usingizi, unalala and then you're gone. And you're like, why don't you wait for the pandemic to be over? <laughs> that is the thinking of man. God doesn't think that way. And that's why he is our rescuer. My, my title for this message is Jesus, our rescuer. Or if you want, God, our rescuer. And we're going to look just into a few scriptures and see people who were rescued by God and, 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 and just get some few lessons from that. And um, hopefully, I'll have convinced you that we are not here because we are the best. We are not here because we know how to do things. We are here because God has ordained that we be here. He has allowed us to be here. So as we occupy this space and this time, let's do it the best way how. That does not mean to say that you're not going to be an upright person. You're not going to be diligent. You're not going to be a hard worker in whatever place you are. It simply means we are doing this knowing that there's a God in heaven who is in charge. Uh, looking at... God our rescue, and as I, I looked out the meaning of, in the, in, the, in the dictionary, the word rescue from the dictionary means to save someone from a dangerous or a harmful situation or difficult situation. So, to rescue 
is to save somebody from a situation that is dangerous, to save somebody from a harmful situation. In its usage, the name or the word uh, rescue, you could say the lifeboat rescued the sailors from the sinking boats. The lifeboat rescued the sailors from the sinking boat. I got this from the dictionary. I don't think I'm very wise. The government has refused to rescue the company from bankruptcy. Six people were rescued by the helicopter or were rescued by helicopter from a fishing boat in distress of the coast. Now, all these situations point out to the fact that if rescue didn't happen, then there was going to be danger, there was going to be fatalities, there was going to be death. Now, that is what we need to understand as we look to God as our rescue. That if he didn't do what he did, then there was destruction coming. There was a fatality. There was death that was uh, looming. Who is a rescuer? Then we could ask. A rescuer is one who helps someone out of a dangerous or unpleasant situation. So the rescue is what we've talked about. The person who, is, who, who rescues, who is the rescuer, is the person who gets you out of a dangerous or unpleasant situation. Rescue missions are performed when there is imminent danger, life-threatening situations, a boat that is capsizing or a ship that is capsizing, or when there is a terrorist attack, like we, we, we know in this country, we, 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 we have had many, and we have seen how rescuers came in. Now, if they didn't come in, things were going to be worse than they did. And that it's the understanding that I want us to carry through. As we look at 2 Peter, chapter number 2, and we're going to read from verse number 4 through to verse number 9. Uh, 2 Peter, chapter number 2, if you give it to us in the NIV, hopefully. This is what scripture says in NIV, please. 2 Peter, chapter number 2, verse number 4 to 9. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness, to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented on his righteous soul by the lawless deeds. He saw and heard, of course, from the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Now, Second Peter, the context of Second Peter is the coming of the Lord. And in the coming of the Lord, we have a lot of discussions that people, you know, peddle and people argue about. So what is coming before what? When is the rapture coming? The truth is there is a day that is called the day of the Lord and is a terrible day. If you read the scriptures, you're going to see everything that surrounds the day of the Lord. It is not a nice day to be found, not on the side of God. But there is an imminence of the, the rapture or the coming of the Lord to pick his people, his people. And that is what I want us to understand. That before we get to that day of the Lord that is a terrible day. Scriptures say in, in other versions that it is a terrible day. It is a day that the, the elements will, will melt. It is a day that 
will be a terrible day. Now, before that day of destruction, before that day, Scripture says that God is going to rescue you. I am one believer of a God who does not take pleasure in seeing his people suffer. God is not excited when you suffer. God is not even sitting somewhere waiting to trap you into some situation. Sema, nina muatea hapa kwa kona. Anakuja. You know, like the, the, the footballers, the way they do it. They are footballers who, who, who are just out to hurt you. <laughs> Either because you have been over them, uh, all over, and so they scheme. And you see their moves. But there are also uh, brothers and uh, other people around here in the, in the, in the estate uh, of late, it has gone down, but if you have lived in Zimmerman uh, quite a bit, you know that they were wailing us in some places. God does not do that. Now, if God does that, that is not the God we are talking about. That is another God. He's not the God of scriptures. And even when he has allowed hard times and difficult situations to come, he knows that it is for his own glory. He does not do that so that he takes pleasure in seeing you suffer. Now, having said that then, we will look at a few of the people that God has rescued. Just to illustrate what, I have, um, what we have read from the scriptures. There was a man, and we just uh, read that, his name was Noah. Noah, in the scriptures, scripture says that he was a righteous man. But you read the account of Noah, God saved Noah because he wanted to save him. He wanted to do something through the life of Noah. So he credited to him righteousness. In the book of Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 6 to 8, and this is God looking at the situation that was around the face of the earth. Scripture says, The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. His heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them, the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God just decided to favor Noah. Noah is living in times when there is wickedness, not just in the human race, but even the animals. Scripture say that even the animals that were created, God was going to wipe them out. But God favors Noah. And because of that then, he tells Noah what he's going to do. Destruction was going to come. And believe you me, when God promises something is going to happen, it is going to happen. When he promises good things, they will happen. When he says destruction is coming, it will happen. And so he says, I regret having created these people. And he tells Noah, this is the plan. You're going to build a knack. And then he narrates everything that needs to be done. Word for word. Inch by inch. The way the ark was to be done. It was not Noah's idea. It was God's idea. Because he needed to rescue somebody. And that somebody was Noah. Because he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Many times we say favor is not fair. Because some people who could be favored could be the worst of the people. I don't know whether in high school you had prefects who were very notorious. When I got to Form 2, I was made a prefect. <laughs> and I know Madam Principal is here and the other teachers who you look at this student and you're thinking, this one can amount to something if they're just nurtured well. But their conduct... If I challenge them with some leadership, they might just 
<laughs> shape up. <laughs> that was me in Form 2. <laughs> I was so sure. They didn't make me a prefect because I had good conduct. <laughs> and the way you are laughing also. Maybe that is what happened to you. But you know, being told, you are now the leader. You're thinking, me? And you're thinking, I, I have to shape up. I remember a story that Pastor, uh, the late uh, Reverend Mwede gave about a thief. You remember? This thief who had come and they were stealing all over. And this time, the pastor says, because I know you are my friend. You, you, <laughs> you're looking for this affirmation. You're looking for somebody who can believe in you. And people know that you are a thief. Then the pastor says, the offering, you're the one to take it to the bank. <laughs> that thief went shaking. Because they had struggled a lot more times to get this kind of money. But this time they were not shaking because they needed to look for money. It was here. They were shaking because somebody trusted them with the money. And they are like, I have to take it to the bank. They have to know I'm a good man. <laughs> now, some of us, <laughs> we got those leadership positions because they needed to tame you. Favor is not fair. <laughs> so Noah is favored by God. And he gets instructions on how to do the ark. And finally, destruction came, just like God had promised. Now, that's Noah. In the book of Genesis, and chapter number 19, we have another man called Lot. We have a lot, <laughs> a lot of people, but we have Lot. And Lot had a whole lot of family. <laughs> he had his wife and his daughters. Now, if you give us verse number 16 of chapter 19 of Genesis, again, God looks at the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and he's fed up with the things that are happening. There was a cry that came to the Lord because of the, the, the wickedness that was in, in Gomorrah and, and, and Sodom and God decides, I'm going to wipe you out. And this now comes after you know, that um, portion where God is saying, I'm going to wipe out these people. And he has sent angels to come on this mission. Verse number 16 says, when he hesitated, now this is Lot. Lot hesitates to leave even when he's prodded by the angels. We need to go. God is rescuing you, not because you are good, because we are going to see that Noah was, um, uh, Lot was not that kind of a man that we, we think. And, and, and angels are saying, leave this place. But scripture says here, when he hesitated, the man grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. For the Lord was merciful to them. They're being rescued from a situation that is coming of destruction. And they don't even want to go. They have to be grabbed. They have... When you're grabbed by human beings, we can understand. These are angels. They are grabbing you, and you still, you are not in for it. You're still struggling, saying, ah, They're saying no. So they took them out of the city. Um, verse number 17. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. This is an angel who is saying, don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plane. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. Verse 18. But Lord said to them, No, my lords, please. <laughs> your servant has found favor in your eyes. And you have shown great kindness to some, uh, to me, in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I will die. Look here. Look. Here's a town near enough to run to, and it's small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. Now, Lot has been rescued. He has been evacuated. But he says, where are you telling me to go? I think this kind of thing that is happening here will, will, will catch up with me. Let me just go next to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a small city nearby. That city was called Zoa. And I'll be safe there. 
Now, without getting in the story of, uh, uh, reading the story of, of, of Lot, when the angels came to visit Lot because they were on a mission, in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, there was so much depravity, there was so much wickedness that people had started exchanging, you know, the, 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 the normal things that people used to do. They had stopped doing that and they were doing the abnormal things. One of the abnormal things was homosexuality in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. And people had sunk so low to the extent that even things that animals don't do, they were doing. And so this night when uh, Lot has visitors, they get word that there are some men who came. Now, if you're talking about a righteous man called Lot, now this is what he did. When they came, he told them, when the men came, the men of the city, say, oh, we have heard there are some men, handsome men. They were even white. They were dressed in some white garments. We think, see angels on a kwanga evil. So we want them. Say, please, guys, and he's negotiating with them. Please don't do that. Let me, I have two daughters. They haven't known any man. Let me give them to you. Now, that's a righteous man. Say, I'll bring them to you. Ah, if I were the one, put yourself in the shoes of, of Lot. And these men have come. Would you give your daughters? <laughs> Say, they are angels. Take them. But you cannot have my daughters. Take those angels. Deal with them. Now, that's, that's me thinking. Oh, I'm so wicked. You would have given your daughters. <laughs> so that is the kind of man that we're talking about. And God comes and rescues him. And as he's being rescued, he's saying, please, don't take me so far. I know these people. They are bad people, yes, but I, I have learned how to live with them. I actually know them. Just take me nearby. The truth is, when the Old Testament talks about these things as they are, because it is the law, it brings out the very bad of Lot, but that is the man God rescued. And in, in the rescue mission, the wife to Lot never made it. Because as they were being evacuated, she looked back. And that looking, looking back is the looking back of, I miss that life. It's not like, wow, they're burning. Is that what God wanted to No. She was not even sorry about, oh God, forgive them. No. She was like, hey, to me talk uko. <laughs> Now that is the wife of Lot. There were two young men who were supposed to be marrying the daughters of Lot. They had a chance also to be rescued. But they said, we cannot live this life. And so they burnt in that sulfur. Scripture says that the following day or after that, there rained sulfur on, on the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and they were burnt out. Now that is Lot, a man that was rescued by God. We have just seen Noah, that's Lot. Then there is another man in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter number 6, verse number 19. This one was a man who was given to serving the Lord. And Daniel gets into problems because he prayed to his God. He was a devout man. He was, he, was, he was a righteous man. He lived for his God. They had been taken into captivity, but he had not left his faith in God from where they had come from. Even in the captivity, he went with his faith. Now, one of the days, because of his diligence and devotion to prayer and serving his God, he is thrown into the den of lions because he refused to obey the decree of, of the king. And the decree of the king, then, the Medes and the Persians, when something was decreed by the king, there was not going to be an appeal. Now, when I read that story, I hear a king who wanted to save Daniel. But because there was a law, there was the constitution, there was a way of doing things, and he did it. He put in Daniel in the lion's den against his will. You would know that he didn't want Daniel to die because the following day when he's coming to check whether Daniel is alive, he comes to ask for Daniel, the servant of the Lord. Did God, your God, save you? And Daniel says, yes, he did. God saved Daniel, a diligent young man, 
one who was sold out to his faith. Now, unlike the other two, we see a man that was sold out to God, but that didn't stop him from going through a situation of the lion's den. But God rescued him. And finally, we read about the children of Israel. The children of Israel, in Egypt, as God is coming to rescue them, we go through a lot of situation in the plagues, and finally we come to the 10th plague, or the 10th, uh, yeah, the 10th plague, which was the death of all firstborns. In the book of Exodus, you will read how the instructions were given of the Passover. In verse number 29 uh, of Exodus chapter number 12, this is what it says. It says, at midnight, now, when all this is happening, by the way, the preceding verses, God has spoken to his people, saying, this is the day. He's telling them there will be destruction in this city. There will be crying. There will be death happening in this city. But for you, this is what I want you to do. You shall do one, two, three. Apply the blood on the doorposts and on the lintels. And, this, and, and the instructions of how the Passover lamb was to be taken are given by God. Now, he is letting this out to them because he is God. He wanted to work with them and he knew what he was doing and he wanted to favor them and rescue them out of the trouble that was coming. And I dare say, God will tell you what will happen. God will let you know about the trouble that is coming and how he's going to rescue you. And so he tells them, in verse number 20, we see what happens in verse number 29. It says, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. The only house that people didn't die was the house of that person who heeded to what God had said. Apply the blood because I want to rescue you. I am coming to rescue you, Noah. I am coming to rescue you, Lot. This is what you're supposed to do. And when they did that, God rescued them. Now, a few lessons that we pick from Having brought these illustrations in the scriptures, then you can deduce, you can conclude that God works in a certain way. God will not, will not be that kind of a man that we're talking about who sits at the corner waiting for you. God will tell you what to do when destruction is coming. God will tell you what you need to do because he is about to pronounce judgment. And he's not telling us because we are better than other people. Like Noah, it is because we have found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He's not telling us because we are better than Lot. No, he's telling us because there is something that he wants to do through us and in us. And so God will rescue us not because we are good, but because of his grace like he did to Lot's family. God is consistent. Is something else that we learn. God is consistent and sure. He will rescue his people before destruction or judgment. He did that to the people of Nineveh. We read of the people of Nineveh again in scriptures, and these this people in Nineveh, they, they had gotten to a place where God was he had said, enough is enough. I'm going to destroy these people. But before he destroyed them, he picks Jonah and tells Jonah, go preach to them so that they can repent. He gives them a chance. And even when Jonah didn't want to go and he did all his, his, uh, his detours and he's finally swallowed by the fish and he comes out a stinking man, I think, one who was not digested by the, the fish in the stomach, for some reason, because God wanted him to go and preach to the Ninevites. I'm sure by the time he's coming out, he looked like an albino, or he was white. 
the last time when I went to, to the coast, I realized that deep in the sea, there is life that happens there. Now, at the show, for those of us who know you have a show, Mahari Kunakonga na Uchafu, Kunakonga na Madfish na Vitukama Hizo. And some of us, the Madfish people who don't know how to swim, Tunakanga hapo, Kuna Uchafu, Mwingi, Makaratasi, everything that you want, it's there. In the deep sea, it's very clean. But even then, in that clean waters, Kuna Wanyama Wengine Huko Amba Wako Huko. There is a spider that has five legs. <laughs> All along I thought spiders have eight legs. I know. <laughs> there is a spider that has five legs. It is called a sea spider. I saw it with his eyes. <laughs> I'm thinking, Jonah was swallowed by this huge fish. A whale. <laughs> now, whale like if you go to hivi, wakati ya natembea kwa maji, kuna vitu nyingi sana zinaingia kwa mdomo wake. Including Jonah. <laughs> And those, those spiders, and, 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 the, and the weeds in the sea, and maybe even other things. So I'm imagining Jonah in that, in that belly of the fish. Kuna spider hapa, kuna nini, amikebe, kuna, you know, all those things. And then finally he's thrown out. Go and preach. Now God had to do that because he needed to rescue people. And Jonah goes finally and preaches to Ninevites. And scripture says, that they turn from their wickedness. So, God will, and God is not, God is not willing you somewhere. God is not, God is not about to, to trick you into some business so that, no, he's outrightly telling you, this is the way to go because I am here for you. I have come to rescue you. Another learning point, God will always deliver on what he has promised. He promised the children of Israel he delivered. He promised Abraham. He delivered. He promised all these other people that we've talked about, and he delivered. Allow me to say this. Because of his proven track record, God would definitely rescue us from the imminent danger. God will allow us to see the signs of the end of times. And that is scriptural. Scripture has said, that as we get closer to the end of the age, certain things are going to be happening. Now, it is for you and I to note what God has said so that we will not be caught in slumber. God has not said that, you know, the end will just come. The rapture might, but the end, he says, there are going to be signs. Please, do not found in slumber. Do not found out of the faith, do not found sleeping. Do not be found there. And I ask, now that you know how God works, and that is just a small way that we can say God works in this way when he wants to rescue us, are you willing to commit your life to him? You could be here and you're saying, well, God cannot destroy people that he created. And I hear that a lot. Are you saying that you Christians are the only ones who are right? So what will happen to all these other faiths? They are whoever's. And they are whoever's. And some of them are our friends. And we even call them our brothers. What will happen? And you're thinking, that is not my case. It is God's case. If they're going to die, ask God. But the truth is, if God has said it, <laughs> it's going to happen. So are you going to commit, are you willing to commit your life to him? Would you be said to have been found to have received favor like Noah? Is God going to pick on you and show his favor because you have exhibited a life of godliness, wanting to Walk alongside God like Noah did. Are you willing to obey what God is saying? Scripture says that Lot was a righteous man. He was just. Would you be willing to be like Lot? In this world where there is a lot of wickedness, but remain just like Lot. Even with all the challenges that we have seen in Lot's family. 
Would you be found obedient like the children of Israel who heard that there was destruction that was coming and they obeyed God when he said, this is the way you are going to do it. You apply the blood and then the angel of death will pass over you. Are you willing? Because destruction will come. The signs are there. Are you willing to obey God? And this is for you and I to keep thinking and asking ourselves, what is the Lord doing at this time? And I want to suggest that God is not an unjust God. God is not excited when we are suffering. God is going to let us know the route of escape. And so he becomes our rescuer. He becomes the Lord who rescues us. Are you here this morning and you have not committed your life to Jesus? I want to introduce you to the man who rescues us. The man who has rescued us. The man who will rescue you. The man who says, I have placed before you life and death. And he says, I dare that you choose life. I beseech you, choose life. He's given us options and said, this is the option I would want you to take. He's not against us. He's our God. He loves us. But there's an option that you need to take. Choose life. Are you here and you're not born again as we bring this service to a close? And we don't have much time. Our time is spent. You want to commit your life to Jesus. Or you're saying, I've been there, but things have happened along the way and I'm not so sure whether we are together with God. You could also lift up your hand. We'll see it and we're going to pray together as we bring this to a close. Shall we pray together? Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you and honor you, the rescuer of our souls. You never hid anything from us. You counted us righteous, not because of the things we have done or we had done, but because you imputed your righteousness on us. You favored us even when we didn't need to be favored. Looking around, there are people who looked better off to be favored but you chose to favor us and so you have given us life and eternal life you have given us to hear and to see from you we pray that in the name of Jesus that we will reciprocate the favor that we have received from you by being obedient to what you are instructing us and so this morning our father in this place we could be in different situations in our hearts, being overwhelmed by things that are happening, some even within our very families. Some could be things that have pulled us down. and Some could even be seen in our lives. We pray that in the name of Jesus, you who is able to rescue us, that you'd come through in the name of Jesus. Save us, redeem us, restore us one more time. Come through for us when sickness and disease is, is, is ravaging God's people. We pray that you who is able to rescue, because you have done it in the past, that you will rescue our people from sicknesses and diseases, our Father, even from this pandemic in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we honor you. We pray that our Father and our Lord, that we'll be attentive, we'll be careful, we'll be, we'll be sensitive to what you're doing, we'll be vigilant to see what you are doing at this time. And even at this season, this time when we know it is the end of the age that none of us will be left out. When we are overwhelmed by situations, we want to look up to you our rescue, the rock that is higher than ourselves. Save us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.